coming up on Network Africa. United Nations chief urges swift return to civilian rule in Burkina Faso, Guinea and Mali. Tunisian president announces plans to rewrite constitution. Plus, protest and miners stop May Day speech by South Africa's president. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tenyo Lashubo Ali. Muslim faithfuls in Nigeria have joined their counterparts around the world to celebrate this year's Eid al-Fitr, which marks the end of Ramadan, the Muslim holy month of fasting. The celebration marks a time of official receptions and private visits when friends visit one another, presenting gifts, wear new clothes, amongst other activities. President Muhammad Buhari also joining other Muslim faithful in Abuja to celebrate, says the fasting period presented an opportunity for reflection, use the occasion of this year's Eid to evaluate the effort of the government in tackling insecurity, acknowledging that the fight has been long and hard and victory is within sight. Well, let us we'll continue to make the environment secure especially when the rainy season is coming so that farmers can go back to their farms and uh, we wouldn't have a problem of food security. Well, um, the heads of services, I mean Navy, Air Force, Inspector General of Police and so on, are very much aware of the situation and their duties to know where the uh, terrorists are and eliminate them. To our main stories for the day now, UN Chief Antonio Guterres has called for the military leaders in Burkina Faso, Guinea and Mali to hand power back to civilians as soon as possible. Speaking after meeting Senegalese President Macky Sall in Dakar, he said they had agreed on the need to keep talking to the de facto authorities in all three countries so as to get a swift return to constitutional order. All three countries struggling with a jihadist insurgency in the Sahel region have recently experienced military coups, Mali in August 2020 and May 2021, Guinea in September 2021 and Burkina Faso in January 2022. Osol is the current chair of the West African bloc ECOWAS, which has suspended all three countries from its membership. ECOWAS imposed heavy sanctions against Mali in January after the regime there rejected a rapid return to civilian rule. It has threatened similar actions against Guinea and Burkina Faso if they fail to enable a swift transition to civilian rule within a reasonable time frame. Meanwhile, opposition leaders in Guinea have rejected the recent 39-month transitional period before a return to civilian rule that was issued by the ruling military leader over the weekend. The National Front for the Defense of the Constitution describes it as a blatant violation of the Constitution. On Saturday, Colonel Mamadi Dombuya, head of the military government, told state television that after political consultations, he was considering a transition of 39 months before a return to civilian rule, adding that the National Transition Council would put proposal to Parliament. Security and Global Affairs Analyst Confidence McCarry joins us now to discuss more on this. Thank you so much for joining us on Network Africa. Thank you for having me. So the military leaders in countries where we've seen recent coups in West Africa, they don't seem particularly in a hurry to return to civilian rule. Why do you think this is, even though ECOWAS has imposed and threatened even more economic sanctions? 
I would think that they, we have having a mismatch in terms of responses to uh, on the continent and the West Africa uh, generally. Kind of leads to two places and the idea that uh, original organization like ECHO was not entirely serious about it. Uh, it, it, it's true. Uh, yes, there have been sanctions like uh, the closing of border, such as suspension of uh, this country's participation in, <coughs> sorry, in uh, the organizations and then. But I, I would think that for uh, Guinea, Guinea was likely to pay the uh, intense criticism that Mali, for instance, received uh, because uh, it, it promised uh, a transition period that. Uh, was supposed to be realistic in national to the country. Uh, initially, it was promised in the transition was between one to three years, and then you took it for five years, and then now you're, taking, you're looking at the set nine month transition, which uh, Mamadi Dumbuya has said that it can be their compromise. Uh, but, but I think that uh, we, the international community, especially ECO, was made quite a uh, heroic mistake in trying to accommodate the Guinean nation regime and not being friendly to it was friendly to Mali and, and the rest of them. So I, I think that's really likely the problem conscious. So the inability to defend the kind of ecology of the Mali, it's not a thing. They're friendly to Mali changing any such thing, but I think it would be important for to have a uniform response for this kind of problem going forward. And talking about the response, looking beyond sanctions, how else can regional bodies like ECOWAS and also bringing in the African Union, how else can they respond uh, to these spate of military takeovers on the continent? Yeah, yeah I, I, don't, I don't believe that it's about it only to host a government takeover. I believe that the problem is too much more systemic and should be faster than it. Uh, international musicians on the continent, ECOWAS and the African Union, have likely been reacting in a sort of way to a lot of those things. Meanwhile, the problems or the issues that make this coup happen have not been addressed. Something we have spoken about it. I talked about how uh, the, the charters of both the ECOWAS and the African Union, especially, came to uh, encourage the disability by international actors of the continent. So was to uh, talk about how uh, the African Union Charter was kind of uh, a change over from just a little bit over from the organizational African Unity Charter, which largely discouraged every form of interventionism whatsoever. So it was kind of a conservative document that eschewed every form of not uh, every form of interference. So you could have a major dictator going on killing the people in the country, and then many of them would largely not respond because if they do, it is going to be a violation of the charter. I mean, something happened in 1967, between 1967 and 1968 during the Nigerian Civil War, uh, when uh, the then Minister of Finance, Abafemi Malo, changed uh, engaging the African uh, OEU, OEU delegates that we tried to enable in Nigeria. Internal crisis that uh, Nigeria is going to come back from it and then form every kind of separate between those that country. So, a lot of these countries take the separate education very seriously, and they are always presently at risk of the other country trying to form those movements. So, uh, you expect it naturally to unlock this you know, sort of speaking if many of these things are going on. And the ECOWAS or Africa Union actually largely adopt this standard where when uh, a it, 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 it president is Basically, on the democratic ideas of the country, like Alpha Conde did in Guinea Bissau, uh, trying to uh, temper the constitution to run for a third term, they don't say anything. There's no condemnation, there's no sanction, there's basically absolutely nothing. And then when the whole house comes crashing down with military people, that, uh, they come out and see fans and want to suspend. So many of these people try to, many of these people ask me to touch with countries as you uh, for lack of better word. So, if you're going to see a proactive international response to uh, unconstitutional government takeover of the continent, I think the first place to begin to start from is the charter uh, which creates these institutional organizations to make them from the reality to be proactive. 
Okay, um, the UN chief is also on a visit to the continent, visiting Senegal. He called for a swift return uh, to civilian rule in Burkina Faso, Guinea and Mali. But some analysts have accused the United Nations of inaction when responding to coups and generally in fulfilling its mandate of maintaining peace and security. Do you agree with this? And if so, why is this? Yeah, yeah. We, we, one of the reasons why schools on the continent are so protected uh, you know, uh, than get quite on over international condemnation of not really a mantle to anything good. It's largely because we, we need we, we have to look at it within the context of global politics. Uh, before the Guinea coup, I think, there was a near of coup of uh, February 2021, which is more than a year old. And despite the international community that came that uh, Condemning the, coup, the military of in power, a lot of checks and thanks to Chi, uh, the president of the country has been sentenced to another, another round of prison for, uh, in, by the military for all sorts of serious charges. And it, but my, my key focus on that particular incident is that when the coup happened, yet we saw very condemnation with, uh, with many of, for many of the, 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 the countries responding. But as I speak to you, uh, Myanmar has not been suspended from the Association of Southeast Asian countries, or uh, Asian Southeast Asian nations, rather. Uh, we, we saw the head of the South Asian the, the Commission go to Myanmar sometime around last year to encourage to facilitate peace dialogue and diplomacy in order to bring to an end the fighting that is going on in some parts of the country. And also to add that many of uh, the, the union members have not stopped trade with Myanmar. So, Sometimes it has to go beyond just condemning coups to outright seven times. I mean, we're seeing what's happening with Russia and Ukraine, how the international community is very swift to respond to sanctions from private companies to government and to that thing to the point of trying to sacrifice uh, a, a gas from, uh, uh, from, from Russia's gas companies in order to support Ukraine. So when it comes to coups, we don't see the United States. And many people criticize the United Nations system and that at the core of everything is politics. And the United Nations you know, is not generally immune from such politics, internal politics and other other. So while one country may come out to condemn a few the other country may not actually feel it a few and may continue to do business with uh, the military regime. So while the military will do these options in those things, there's hardly any incentive for it in that all right, then, Security and Global Affairs Analyst Confidence McCarry, thank you so much for your thoughts on Network Africa. Thank you for Still to come on the program. Kenyan president increases country's minimum wage by 12%. More details in a moment. Stay with Thanks for staying with us. The United Nations Human Rights Office says Mali's ban on two major international broadcasters operating inside the country is a worrying development and reflects, uh, reflects growing regional intolerance towards freedom of expression. OHCR uh, spokesperson says the move against the Radio France International and France 24 is just the latest in a string of actions by the military authorities. Mali has seen two armed ouster in the last two years, the first in August 2020 and the second in May last year. And over in North Africa, Tunisian President Kais Saeed has announced plans to rewrite his country's constitution. In a televised Eid address, Mr. Saeed, who has dissolved government in parliament, said a committee would be established to re redraft the existing framework and would conclude its work within days. He did not specify how the constitution would be changed, but said it would usher in what he called a new republic. Opponents have accused him of seeking to concentrate all the levers of power in his own hands since he seized power nine months ago. 
The chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Karim Khan, has revealed a new investigation strategy for the ongoing investigation into the situation in Libya to the UN Security Council. The ICC investigation focuses on alleged crimes against humanity and war, crimes committed in Libya Greater since the efficiency. overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi's government in February 2011. The investigation also includes three unexecuted arrest warrants issued by the ICC. The ICC began its investigation in March 2011. The binding reality is that in these types of crimes, we simply can't act alone. It's hubris to think that the ICC or any national authority very often can act alone when the crimes that seem to have taken place could constitute either genocide or crimes against humanity or war crimes. Structures are broken. Structures can't operate. Witness protection becomes a real issue in so many parts of the world. And uh, the way to improve and bend the arc towards justice is by working together independently, effectively, testing evidence received from any source, trying to make sure evidence is reliable, and there's many tried and tested forensic means uh, to do that. But if we do so, uh, I think we can fulfill our mandate with ever greater efficiency. There are challenges, the political situation, the security situation uh, in Libya that the Libyan authorities are dealing with is, is difficult, it's dynamic, it's challenging. Of course it has implications uh, to investigations, but there's always different means with goodwill, with imagination, uh, to try to make sure things move forward uh, effectively. Uh, I have tried to be transparent in this report. I have set benchmarks. I will continue to set more benchmarks so that hopefully we can ensure that the important responsibility given by this council in resolution 1970 is vindicated, and even more importantly, that the victims and the survivors are not an afterthought, that we put them centre stage and make sure that their rights uh, are properly and fully vindicated to the best of our abilities. According to an international labour organisation report, economic and social progress in least developed countries have been slowed by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change and the ongoing energy and food crisis. Presenting the report, Malawi Vice President and Chair of the LDC Group, Salas Chilema, says there is a sizable youth population in the LDCs that countries must take as a very big asset. According to the ILO, only 14% of the population of LDCs have access to any one social benefit. For other developing countries, the figure is 45%, and for developed countries, 85%. The fact that the pandemic has caused a lot of setbacks in LDCs, uh, particularly in the fight against poverty, uh, competitiveness, uh, access to public health, as well as uh, uh, quality of education. There is a sizable youth population which we must take as a very big asset in the LDCs. Uh, the world today be, be, belongs to the youth uh, and the youth therefore must be uh, capacitated and enabled to do what they must do. Agency is key. We don't have the luxury of time and we must act and the time is now. This, these are economies firstly where the vast majority of people work in conditions of informality. 89% uh, is the aggregate figure of people working in LDCs work informally. The global figure is 61%. Any policy interventions have to take cognizance of this reality of all pervasive informality. Our figures show that only uh, 14, that's 1-4%, of the population of LDCs have access to any one social benefit. Uh, and by comparison, again, the corresponding figure for other developing countries is 45%. Uh, for developed countries, we're at 85%. There is a massive social protection deficit. This has been laid bare in the most dramatic and sometimes brutal way uh, by the COVID uh, pandemic. Line. If you want, you can open. 
South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa had to leave a May Day rally after workers stormed the stage where he was speaking on Sunday. Chanting Cyril must go, they held up signs demanding a wage increase during a ceremony in a stadium near the northwestern city of Rustenburg. The protesters who worked at a local mine have been striking for weeks. President Ramaphosa tried to address the miners' concerns but was greeted by booing. The workers want an annual salary pay rise of a thousand rand, a demand which President Ramaphosa addressed directly, saying we have heard that message and will be dealing with that matter. And Kenya's president, Uhuru Kenyatta, has announced a 12% increase in the minimum wage to offset soaring living costs. He says it's to help workers cope with a surge in consumer prices driven in part by the war in Ukraine. The 12% increase raises the minimum monthly wage from 13,500 Kenyan shillings, about $116, to 15,120 shillings, that's $130. This announcement comes a few few months ahead of the presidential and parliamentary elections in the country. Inflation in the East African country rose to 6.47 percent year-on-year last month, from 5.56 percent in March. Last month, the country suffered shortages of fuel, with traffic in some parts of Nairobi coming to a standstill as motorists joined long queues outside petrol stations. UNICEF Executive Director Catherine Russell has urged the international community to immediately scale up support to avert a humanitarian catastrophe due to the drought in Ethiopia and the rest of the Horn of Africa. She made the appeal at the end of a four-day visit to Ethiopia. Due to three failed consecutive rainy seasons, four countries across the Horn of Africa are experiencing one of the worst droughts in decades. Overall, in Djibouti, Ethiopia, Kenya and Somalia, 10 million children need urgent life-saving support. The drought is pushing up malnutrition for children and their families at an alarming rate. Overall, 1.7 million children are severely malnourished across the sub-region. Here in the Horn of Africa, where the, the consequences of a severe drought in three years of Poor rains are really ha having a terrible impact on children. We're estimating 10 million children are in need of life-saving support. And at this point, 1.7 million children are requiring something we call, they have severe acute malnutrition, which is the most serious form of malnutrition, and we're, we're treating them and, and treating as many as we can. The challenge here is that the needs are so much greater than what we're able to address at this point. And we don't know yet how bad it's going to get, but we do know for sure that many children are already suffering, are very much in need, their mothers are in need, and you can see it when you talk to them. The mothers are so concerned, worried about what, what's happening to their children, um, but, you know, the, we need more resources. We need to get more feeding to these children uh, if we want to really avert a very serious and terrible problem here. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenyola Shubo Ali. Bye for now.